Hello, so uh, I'm Dr. Letterer from the uh, Nephrology Division, and, uh, and actually I didn't know whether this was the emergency lecture series or not, but this isn't an emergency lecture. You know, this is just a lecture about electrolyte cases. Um, I've, given, I've given sodium, potassium, and water lectures, this is embarrassing to say, but ever since 1981. Um, and I, I guess what I have found over the years is that when I simply give a physiology lecture or a pathophysiology lecture, what people tell me is they, they can follow with me very well while I'm talking, and then it's like the minute they leave the room, they can't remember anything that I said, and they can't apply it to a patient. So, so this lecture, what we're going to do is I'm going to present two cases. And these are two cases that each of you guys has seen at least once um, that are more like a real life situation where you would have a fluid and electrolyte issue. So, all right, so some rules of electrolytes to take home forever. No matter what you see happens to the electrolytes of people in the hospital, for all of us healthy people sitting here, our electrolytes are all maintained within strict boundaries. So for this young man sitting in this row there, his serum sodium today is 140, last week was 140, next year it's gonna be 140. It's not like the hospital where you look and one day it's 140, the next it's 136, the day after that is 138, then it's 142. We are very, very strictly held within bounds. So deviations from that actually almost always suggest very significant pathology, even though the patient may not be jumping up and down screaming, I'm dying. I see urine electrolytes ordered a lot. The single most important thing to remember about urine electrolytes is that you have to interpret them in the context of the clinical situation. There is no such thing as a normal. I know that many times it'll come back into the side and says, Urine sodium, 40 to 70 normal. Well, under some circumstances it is. Probably for all of us sitting in this room, all of our, our urine sodiums would be between 40 and 70. But for a sick hospitalized patient, that's not the case. And if you're actually gonna understand what happens with your patients and their electrolytes, you have to know some normal homeostasis. So we're gonna do a little bit of that too. Okay, so here's case one. This is not gonna be in a complete board format sort of thing. But this is a case that all of us have seen multiple times. 75-year-old man with heart failure is admitted for progressive volume overload. He undergoes aggressive diuresis with a Bumex strip at one milligram an hour, and after a week, he's lost 17 pounds. He is much improved, although he still probably has some edema. And you check lab work on the anticipated day of discharge and, uh-oh. Your attending goes, you say, I want to discharge this guy. Here were his laboratory work on the day of admission. Now here's his laboratory work on the day that you're planning to discharge him. So our questions that we're going to look at are, what is the etiology of the presenting problem? What is the pathophysiology of the electrolyte uh, changes that we saw? What are the potential complications of these electrolyte changes? How would you treat them? And how would you prevent this happening in the future? Okay, so let's look at volume overload with heart failure. Very simplistically put, what you have is a situation where um, you have decreased renal perfusion because of poor cardiac output. This then stimulates the activation of sodium retentive factors. The counteractivation of some natriuretic factors but in the grand scheme of things, the anti-natriuretic factor, or the sodium retaining factors, are stronger than the natriuretic ones. So you have a primary sodium absorption. You've got a secondary water absorption. This then leads to worse heart failure. You have a vicious cycle, and the guy gets worse and worse and worse with more and more edema. Okay, so what is normal sodium homeostasis for us in this room? Normally what happens is we have a dietary intake 
of about 150 to 350 milliequivalents per day of sodium. Our kidneys get rid of almost exactly the same amount. Our normal fractional excretion of sodium is around 1%. That is to say, 1% of your total filtered sodium is what is excreted, approximately. And this is why when you guys do that test, when you're looking at somebody with kidney failure and you are calculation, calculating the fractional excretion of sodium, this is where this 1% comes from. It's because under normal conditions, our fractional excretion of sodium, when we are euvolemic, is about 1 to 1.1 or 1.2%. So when somebody is volume depleted, their fractional excretion of sodium drops because they have avid sodium retention. Now, how does your body know I've got enough salt? My exercise or fluid volume is normal. How does it know? It's got specific sensory mechanisms, which we're all familiar with, and it's got these effector mechanisms. But the long and the short of it is that the major effector mechanism that comes into play is renal sodium handling. And there we have the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the autonomic nervous system, both of which enhance sodium reabsorption. Then you have like the natriuretic peptides and other um, hormonal type factors that will blunt that to a certain extent. So you've got to think about your kidneys as being vascular fields of confrontation. And you have this constant conflict between these forces that are saying, hold on to salt, hold on to salt, hold on to salt, and these forces that say, get rid of salt, get rid of salt. In the grand scheme of things, your sodium retaining factors are always more powerful than the ones that promote sodium release. On the other hand, it's also very important for you to recognize that for when any one of these sets of factors is activated, either this one or this one, you have a counterbalance from the other side. So there's no such thing as, under normal pathophysiologic conditions, as just activating these and these not being activated at all. It's almost like your body is saying, you know, gee whiz, I need this salt, I need to retain this salt, but the other side is going, now, but just, just hold on one second, maybe not quite that much. Where does this come into play? This comes into play clinically when you're looking at the situation of somebody who has a tenuous volume balance or a tenuous renal perfusion. So our guy there with heart failure, your patient with cirrhosis, the person who is taking a diuretic, or the guy who's had nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. They have all, all of these people have massive activation of these sodium retentive factors that cause your kidney to retain salt, but at the same time, they've also released these things that very slightly blunt the effect and also serve to keep your renal vasculature open. These are the individuals that are extraordinarily high risk for acute kidney injury when you block these. So this is why people who are, have cirrhosis, heart failure, or volume depletion are very prone to acute kidney injury when you give them a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. When you give those guys a non-steroidal, you block the production of prostacyclines, nitric oxide, and therefore you take away you know, some of that vasodilatory and antidiuretic effect. Okay. So how is sodium reabsorbed in the kidney? This is, of course, what I love the most. I realize that you guys don't, but there's actually a purpose in this slide. So in the proximal tubule, 60% of it's reabsorbed, primarily through the sodium hydrogen exchanger. In the thick ascending limb, about 30% of it's absorbed. So you can see you've already reabsorbed the vast majority of your sodium in what we would consider the more proximal portions of the nephron. And then in the distal convoluted tubule and in the medullary collecting duct, then you have the rest of your sodium absorbed. So here it is through the sodium hydrogen exchanger. Here it's through our friend, the sodium potassium 2-chloride cotransporter. 
Here, it's through the sodium chloride co-transporter, and here, it is through the epithelial sodium channel. Now, why is it important for you to recognize that at all? That's because our diuretics, the diuretics that you use every day, they were all designed to hit one of those transporters. So your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, they block the function of sodium hydrogen exchangers. They block proximal tubule sodium reabsorption. Your loop diuretics, they block the function of NKCC2. Your thiazide diuretics, they block the function of the sodium chloride co-transporter, and your potassium sparing diuretics block the function of your epithelial sodium channel. Every single one of these diuretics has complications, some of them which are intuitively obvious and very predictable, and some of them that, that quite frankly aren't. But a couple of things I'd like to point out to you. Two of the diuretics, the loop diuretics and the thiazide diuretics, produce hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis. Two of the diuretics produce metabolic acidosis. One of them uh, has hyperkalemia associated with it. The other one has hypokalemia associated with it. So knowing what your, what your uh, complications of your diuretics are should help you foresee what is going to happen to a patient when you give them particularly high doses and combination diuretics. Okay, so let's go back to our guy. Let's go back to our guy. So to break the ice, and have people in the audience actually participate in this lecture, does anybody want to point out what has changed between these two sets of electrolytes? This is not a trick question. Chloride's gone down? Right. Right. So exactly, so a whole slew of things. I cannot even begin to tell you how many times each year that I am consulted for exactly this situation. Okay, so here's what we have. Now let's go back, we've talked about sodium. Let's go back and talk a little bit about potassium. Why do we even have potassium? And just so you know, two major functions. One of them is maintenance of cell volume. This will become important later. And determination of resting cell membrane potential that helps our, our organs that are responsible for functions involving electrical activity work. We don't actually know how potassium is sensed. Again, you might ask yourself the question, how does your body know I have enough potassium or I don't have enough potassium or my serum potassium is normal or it's high or it's low? Amazingly enough, we do not know, although we do know that there may be sensors on the adrenal gland and the pancreas. We generally take in a dietary excess of about a milliequivalent per kilogram per day. The kidney excretes about 90% of that load, and we have obligatory renal losses of about 20 milliequivalents per day. Your kidney can maintain potassium balance, even though it's responsible for getting rid of 90% of it, up to a point where the GFR is around 20 mLs per minute. So it can do pretty well up to a, a very, very advanced kidney failure. Now the ability of the kidney to get rid of potassium is highly dependent upon function here in the distal convoluted tubule and the cortical collecting duct. And this is the site in the kidney which is aldosterone sensitive. So the factors that influence potassium secretion at that site are the presence or absence of aldosterone, high potassium itself, the amount of sodium that's delivered, the presence of alkalosis, and the presence of negative ions. Remember that at that site, the potassium that is secreted is done in response to sodium that is reabsorbed through the epithelial sodium channel. Okay, so when we go back to our guy who has hypokalemia and we look at our differential diagnosis of hypokalemia, this can be due either to a decreased intake, which is vanishingly rare, an increased output, which is actually very common, or shift to the intracellular space 
uh, which we see sometimes, not all that often though. We know that there are many different complications of hypokalemia and in a heart failure patient whose K has dropped from 3.8 to 2.8, you would worry about what? Nothing? Perhaps heart problems? Perhaps cardiac arrhythmias? Uh, for example, development of hypomagnesemia and maybe torsade. So when somebody is hypokalemic and they have heart failure, then yeah, you're worried a lot about uh, tachyarrhythmias, <laughs> premature beats, EKG changes. One other thing that I would like to point out that again is of interest to this guy's case is that hypokalemia is also linked with an increase in ammonia genesis and bicarbonate transport. And this is one of the reasons that you see hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis linked so much, is that once somebody starts developing a metabolic alkalosis and they become hypokalemic, you will actually get more bicarbonate reabsorbed in the proximal tubule thus exacerbating your metabolic alkalosis problem. Okay, so here's your typical picture of somebody who has EKG changes from uh, hypokalemia. And we go to metabolic alkalosis. The important thing to remember, the single most important thing to remember about metabolic alkalosis is that once you have developed it, you've got to maintain it. So if you've got normal kidney function, and I just forced sodium bicarb down your throat to give you a metabolic alkalosis, your kidneys would just get rid of it and you would not continue to have a metabolic alkalosis. Unlike the case that we just had presented where the guy has a fixed bicarbonate of 35 or whatever. Your differential diagnosis of metabolic alkalosis you make by measuring the urine chloride. If the urine chloride is low, this is consistent with vomiting. And vomiting is your prototype for a chloride sensitive or saline sensitive metabolic alkalosis. Obviously you can also get this with volume depletion or with diuretics pertinent to this case. Now what about if your urine chloride is high? Your prototype for metabolic alkalosis associated with a high urine chloride is mineralocorticoid excess, like Kahn syndrome, primary hyperaldo. However, if you have somebody who is taking diuretics at the very moment that you get their urine chloride, it'll be high. Also note that hypokalemia per se will also give you a high urine chloride. There are lots of complications of metabolic alkalosis pertinent to this case respiratory depression, low magnesium, low K, and fatal arrhythmias, particularly as the pH rises above 7.55, then the incidence of arrhythmias increases pretty dramatically. Okay, so now let's go back to the guy that we had. We had a decrease in his serum sodium from day of admission to a week later. How did that happen? That happened because you were giving this guy a diuretic, he was losing extracellular fluid volume, was he drinking saline? No. He was drinking water, Sprite, Coca-Cola, coffee, whatever it is. So basically, he's losing salt and water, replacing it with water. Why did he have a decrease in his potassium? Increased K excretion due to enhanced distal sodium reabsorption at the cortical collecting duct from the diuretics that he was taking. Why did he have a rise in his bicarbonate? It is because with his volume depletion, he had an increase in proximal tubule reabsorption of bicarb. He had increased chloride losses to the decreased loop of Henle reabsorption of chloride that counterbalanced the increase in his bicarb. And obviously, he had an increase in his BUN and creatinine due to the relative decrease in his intravascular volume. Okay, now, now is the time for real audience participation. 
this is your guy, you wanted to send him home, but now you've got a passel of electrolyte abnormalities that you've got to take care of. Now what are you going to do for this guy? We have a bunch of choices here. Normal saline plus KCL, conobaptan. Does everybody here know what conobaptan is? So this is the water transport inhibitor that you can use for people who are hyponatremic. You can give him a bolus of 3% saline. You can do water restriction. Instead of bumetanide, give him chlorothiazide instead or replace his potassium or any of combination of the above. All right, does anybody have anything here that they don't want to do? That they would look at that and they go, no, this is just not a good answer. Three percent saline. Why would you give him three percent saline? Yes, he's a little hyponatremic, but I gave you no indication that the guy was massively symptomatic from his hyponatremia. So that one doesn't make any sense. So we'll knock 3% saline off the list. Is there anything else here that you want to knock off the list? Just doesn't seem to be a good idea. Okay, so somebody says water restriction. Why would you not want to do water restriction? I'm sorry? Okay, so what is it that determines your volume status? Is it the amount of water in the body? It's sodium, right, exactly. So in this case, you know, you may want to tell the guy, okay, we're going to restrict your water today. That might be a reasonable thing to try. Anything else here that you want to just toss? Oh, boy. Like I'm going to chew up somebody. How about the normal saline at 150 cc's an hour? All right, ask yourself the question. This poor guy just came in the hospital with bad heart failure. You have spent the entire week trying to get volume off of him. Do you really want to turn around and give him four liters of saline over the next day? Hopefully everybody out there is saying to themselves, no, we would have to keep him in for another three days to take it off again. Exactly. So. So giving him saline, it would certainly correct his sodium. It would correct his chloride. The extra KCL would go some distance toward um, improving his K. His BUN and creatinine might come down, but you would simply be undoing what you had done for the past week, or at least half of it, by giving him four liters of saline. So this is probably an extreme response that you would not want to do. What about substituting chlorothiazide for bumetanide? So instead of giving him that loop diuretic, you know, that gave him the hypokalemia and the metabolic alkalosis, let's try a thiazide diuretic. Good idea, bad idea? Somebody back there is, is saying no, and that is correct, because what acid-base disorder do you get with a thiazide? you get a metabolic alkalosis, right? You get a metabolic alkalosis and hypokalemia with a thiazide diuretic. So in fact, if anything, you make, make things worse if you substitute a thiazide diuretic for his loop diuretic right now. Does everybody understand that? Both of those diuretics, the loop diuretics and the thiazide diuretics have exactly the same result when it comes to acid-base disorder and potassium homeostasis. Okay, what about giving him some potassium? Does anybody have any problems with that? Does anybody see a downside? Is there a particular potential issue with giving him potassium? He's got some kidney failure, right? His creatinine's now gone up to 2.1. So, what are you worried about the most right now? He's developing an arrhythmia and dying of an arrhythmia? or giving him some potassium and maybe his K will go up from 2.8 to 5. Hopefully you're more worried about the first thing, that he would actually develop an arrhythmia from his hypokalemia. So giving him some potassium would be a very reasonable thing to do. 
Now, remember we talked about what is one of the major functions of potassium in your body? It is to determine your intracellular volume. It is a determinant of your intracellular volume. So when you have somebody who is hyponatremic, you will find if they're also hypokalemic, you will have a much harder time correcting their hyponatremia if you don't correct their potassium as well. So another reason to give this guy potassium would be to help you in correcting his hyponatremia as well. Okay, so for his hypokalemia, here are choices here. We can discontinue his bumetanide, add spironolactone, add chlorothiazide, or add potassium. Any of these that you wanted to toss? Yeah, adding chlorothiazide is not going to help. If anything, it'll probably make it worse. So, so this is not a good idea. On the other hand, any of the other three would be fairly reasonable. What about for his metabolic alkalosis? So here are your choices here. Is there anything here that you want to toss? I'm sorry? Yeah, okay, so you don't want to do a thiazide diuretic. Remember, one of the complications of thiazide diuretics is the metabolic alkalosis. So substituting or adding a thiazide diuretic to his Bumex is not going to make that better. It'll probably make it worse. When do you use hydrochloric acid to treat somebody's metabolic alkalosis? It's when they're on the verge of a cardiac arrest. So for somebody who has a mild hyperbicarbonatemia, which he has, you're not going to use 0.1 normal hydrochloric acid. I can just tell you that in my 30 some odd years of practice, I've had to use that twice. So this is a very rare thing. What about our normal saline at 150 cc's an hour? Remember, we just talked about this. Probably not a good idea. What about adding spironolactone? Good idea or bad idea? Does anybody see any advantages to giving him spironolactone? Yeah, it's going to help his potassium. It would mean that you would not have to stop his diuresis but you could give him some a potassium sparing diuretic to blunt both the potassium losses as well as the hydrogen ion losses. So you could address both his hypokalemia and his metabolic alkalosis with the spironolactone. Oh, I'm sorry. Very importantly. Okay. Who wants to give him a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor to get rid of his bicarb? You guys are a strangely passive lot. Okay, there are times when a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor for bad metabolic alkalosis is really useful. But one thing to remember is that if somebody starts off hypokalemic, you will never, ever correct their bicarb with a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. You've got to aggressively replace their potassium first and then you can safely use a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Okay, so a reasonable way to go about him, this is your situation. Okay, so you can't send the guy home today, but you might be able to do it tomorrow. So what would you do maybe? Decrease his Bumex, he sure doesn't need a milligram per hour anymore. Add spironolactone, give him one dose of potassium because after all he has developed kidney failure and you're going to be giving him a, a potassium sparing diuretic. Do a little water restriction and then recheck his laboratory work. Okay, does anybody have any particular questions about this type of approach? This way you have salvaged your work in getting him out of heart failure without giving him all that volume back again. And yet you are addressing every single one of the electrolyte abnormalities that we saw here. Okay, so in this situation, I think the single most important lesson that I can impart to all of you is that the electrolyte changes that were seen in this case are completely and totally predictable. 
All the things that happened here is because the guy was on a BMX strip. It's not that a BMX strip is a bad thing. I'm just saying that every single one of these electrolyte abnormalities are a direct result of his BMX. These are all abnormalities that could have been predicted from the mechanism of action and the known complications of the BMX. So, anticipate these changes. When you start seeing little things start happening, intervene then. Don't wait until they're sort of out of control. If you have asymptomatic hyponatremia complicating heart failure, you can use water restriction if it's a temporary thing. You can use tolvaptan if it is a, a chronic thing. Hypokalemia due to diuretics. Generally, the usual approaches are to decrease the diuretic that's causing potassium wasting, add a potassium sparing diuretic, and then you can use cautious potassium replacement. You have to be really, really careful with your potassium replacement if you have somebody who has chronic kidney disease plus you put them on a potassium sparing diuretic because you can actually get very dramatic swings in the potassium. But it's, let me just say, infinitely easier for a patient to tolerate 40 milligrams of Lasix and 25 milligrams of spironolactone as opposed to 40 milligrams of Lasix and then potassium chloride 20 milliequivalents TID plus several other doses given IV. Metabolic alkalosis, again, decrease your loop and thiazide diuretics. You can add a potassium sparing diuretic, and you can add a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor once your potassium is repleted. Okay, so does anybody have any questions about case one? All right, let's move on to case two then. Case two is a 56-year-old woman with cirrhosis. She presents with encephalopathy, She's massively volume overloaded. She's got huge ascites, peripheral edema. So in addition to the other junk that you do for somebody who's got hepatic encephalopathy, you initiate diuresis with a combination of Lasix and spironolactone. This is right by the book. 40 milligrams of Lasix, 25 of spironolactone. And you start lactulose for the encephalopathy. She loses 15 pounds over the week, and she is feeling infinitely better except for she's got this pesky diarrhea, which has been bothering her some. But other than that, she feels a whole lot better. Okay, you're getting ready to discharge her. You decide to check the lab, and here's what you have. Okay, does, hopefully everybody sees a few differences in the electrolytes between the day of admission and the day when you were planning to discharge her. Okay, so, our questions are, why did her serum sodium go up so much from 132 to 152? Why is her potassium risen? What is the acid-base disturbance that she has and what is the most likely cause? How would you treat her and how would you prevent another recurrence of this? Okay, so let's take a moment and look at water transport. Remember that water is absorbed throughout the kidney almost totally dependent upon the presence and the absence of antidiuretic hormone. That, that is your major regulator of water transport. The rest of the regulators of water transport throughout the kidney are purely physical. So in the proximal tubule, where 60% is reabsorbed, it's all isosmotic. Remember the thin descending limb of the loop of Henle, you know, the the uh, epithelium here is uh, permeable to water. So as the loop of Henle dives down into the hyperosmotic uh, interstitium, into the medulla and the papilla, then you just get water moving out passively. Here, you don't get water moving out passively because it's impermeable. And then what happens here at our friend, the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle? This site is so incredibly important, of course, for lots of things, but from a water transport. It is very important because here you have active transport of solute in the absence of water. And as you course through the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle into the distal convoluted tubule, the osmolality 
of the fluid inside the tubule now becomes less than your serum. So in other words, this is the first place in your kidney where you are actually creating free water. Then, again, depending upon the absence of ADH or the presence of ADH, either you keep absorbing solute and your urine osmolality goes down very low and you pee a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, or you have a lot of ADH present and all that water that you made here, all this free water just gets sucked up. Your urine osmolality is very high and your urine volume is very low. So I would submit to you that you guys live this every single day. Every single day. So, you know, for those of you who have been managing to keep yourself awake during these three lectures in a row, by virtue of drinking a giant coffee for every hour of it, you know that periodically you've just to hurry, get up and hurry up and go pee because you have diluted your body fluids, you've turned off your ADH, all that free water that you make is rushing into your bladder and you go up and pee and it looks like water. It's almost water, but it's not quite water. And this is a very important concept as well. Your urine osmolality is never zero. It always has to have something in it. Sodium, urea, a ketone, you know, some sort of metabolic product in there has to be in there. You can't put out free water, only water, in your kidneys. Now, on the other hand, if you were on the green service at the VA and you had 10 patients to see that morning and you woke up late and you didn't have time for breakfast or anything and you ran in the hospital and you saw your 10 patients and then you, you know, endured the torture of being pimped during rounds and felt humiliated and awful but also had a scut list that was this big and he wanted to get out of the hospital by five so heck you just skipped lunch and you just kept working on through all of a sudden you might realize near the end of the day three or four o'clock well, you know, I haven't peed so you go in to make yourself pee and what happens a little bit comes out and it's very 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 dark so this happens on a daily basis your ability to maintain your body fluid osmolality is unbelievably and remarkably precise, exacting, and instantaneous, absolutely instantaneous. This is why, so your urine osmolality can get to be 1200, so you can put out as little as half a liter of urine a day and maintain electrolyte homeostasis. You can put out 20 liters a day if you're sitting there and deciding that you're studying for your tests and you just want to drink one two liter bottle of Big Red after the next, you can do it, man, and you will not become hyponatremic. This is really quite remarkable, a quite remarkable thing. Okay, our lady was hypernatremic. Her serum sodium went up from 132 to 152. Why was that? How come all of us don't become hypernatremic? What happens to us? that keeps that from happening. You get thirsty. That is exactly right. You get thirsty. And when you get really thirsty, what happens? You don't turn around and go back to sleep and say, well, okay, I'll just take care of this in the morning. No, you get up and get something to drink. I mean, that's, that is a, an innate mechanism there to keep you from getting hypernatremic. So, the situations where you see an adult who is hypernatremic, either they cannot sense or respond to thirst, or they have very excessive water losses. If these water losses are from the kidney, then they're going to have polyuria. They're going to have a bunch of urine output. If these water losses are non-renal, like GI, sweat, or insensible losses, then you're going to have very little urine output. Every once in a while we see somebody where the primary problem is somehow they got hypertonic sodium ingestion. Somebody got too much 3% saline. Somebody in the middle of a code got too many amps of bicarb. 
you know, something like that happening, but that's pretty uncommon in the adult situation. Okay, so how can you tell the difference in this lady that's hypernatremic? Well, one simple thing is you would look at her urine output, right? And if her urine output was really, really high, despite the fact that her uh, serum sodium was 152, you'd go, ooh, I bet she's having renal losses of water. On the other hand, if her urine output has dropped off dramatically, then the chances are pretty good that she's hypernatremic because she's losing water through other places, one obvious one being stool, if she's having a lot of diarrhea, and that's the major cause, so they'll be oliguric. Okay, so if the urine osmolality is less than around 300, then we would assume in this lady it's her diuretic-induced water losses that are causing her hypernatremia. On the other hand, if her urine osmolality is greater than 600, then we would attribute it to the diarrhea. If we look at her hyperkalemia, I think, you know, in this particular case, it's pretty straightforward. You know, did she take in too much? Probably not. Is she shifting it from her intracellular to her extracellular space? Probably not. We've got some big reasons here why she should become hyperkalemic, right? Number one, her BUN and creatinine have gone up. Secondly, she's on a potassium sparing diuretic, which would uh, make it difficult for her kidneys to get rid of potassium. Okay, so as opposed to hypokalemia, um, hyperkalemia can cause different EKG changes and, in fact, cardiac arrest. And here is a relatively typical EKG of somebody who has fairly advanced hyperkalemia um, with um, uh, some of the changes that you see here. The peak T waves, which, you know, I know from the recent literature is kind of going out of vogue as a way to diagnose uh, hyperkalemia, uh, but loss of the P wave loss of the PR interval, uh, widening of the QRS. This is a person that you would jump in with calcium and give it to them. Okay, so let's go back to our lady. Let's go back to our case. So we've got, anybody care to comment on our abnormalities that we have here? Since nobody does, I will. So we've got hypernatremia, hyperkalemia, the bicarb is low, the BUN and creatinine have risen. Now in this case also, we got some urine electrolytes too that are kind of interesting. So when she came in, remember we said that she had ascites, she was edematous, she was encephalopathic, etc. So when somebody's edematous, that means they have an increase in their extracellular fluid volume, right? Now, if somehow I did that, to that young man sitting over there. I just stuck a large bore needle in him and I just started filling him up with saline to where he was just blimping out, you know, with sodium chloride. What would his urine sodium be? High, normal, or low? You're there. What do you think your urine sodium? Would it be high? So it would be really high. It'd probably be 153. It'd probably be exactly what I'm putting in there. So, this person who has extracellular fluid volume excess, urine sodium is very low at 22. Losing a bunch of potassium, which you do in states where you have very avid sodium retention. She's placed on the furosemide and spironolactone, and here we are a week later. What do these urine electrolytes tell you compared to admission? Yeah, she's getting rid of her sodium better than she was, certainly. She is retaining potassium. Heck. Her spironolactone and her Lasix are working. And in fact, if you're on the liver service, you know, and they're treating a lot of patients who are cirrhotics with, with Lasix and spironolactone, you know, sometimes this is just a test that they do periodically, is to get their urine lights and see, do we have an adequate dose of Lasix and spironolactone on board? And if they see this, that looks great. If their urine K is still pretty high or their urine sodium is still 22, then they're going to bump up the dose of the diuretics to get the desired result. 
Okay, so why did she have hyperkalemia? She had a potassium sparing diuretic. She also had a metabolic acidosis. Just for your recollection, her anion gap here is 10. High, normal, or low? I think I heard a normal there in the back. Whoever is it that whispered that, you are right. An anion gap of 10 is normal. So this person has a normal anion gap, metabolic acidosis. You know, here is our differential here. And in her case, it could be one of two things, right? She's got two issues that could give her the metabolic acidosis of a normal anion gap. But anybody like to guess what one of them is? Her diarrhea. So her diarrhea is one. What's the other? I'm sorry? Her renal failure. I'll give that to you. So we'll make it three. Remember the third one, what diuretic is she on? Spironolactone, right? She's on spironolactone, a potassium sparing diuretic. Remember that one of the effects of that is to give you a metabolic acidosis. So she's got a, she's got a few reasons why she could have a metabolic acidosis. Um, and in order to decide, we look at her urine electrolytes. And if somebody has a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis due to diarrhea, what would you expect their urinary anion gap to be? Less than zero. That is correct. So remember that the urinary anion gap you calculate using the urine sodium, the potassium, and the chloride, because there's usually not any bicarbon, even if there were, we don't measure it. And one of the major mechanisms that we have for getting rid of acid is to get rid of it in the form of ammonium chloride, so NH4 plus chloride. So a normal person with normal kidney function who has a metabolic acidosis, you would expect to see a lot of ammonium chloride in the urine. And since we don't measure ammonium, then it's not going to show up in the electrolytes and your urinary anion gap will be negative. In fact, it's usually really negative, like minus 60. What is hers? It's plus 20. So what this tells you is that she's actually having a problem with renal excretion of hydrogen ion. She cannot, she cannot put ammonium chloride in the urine, and she can't put ammonium chloride in the urine, why? It's because of her spironolactone. This is one of the complications of the spironolactone. Okay, so. so we've got hypernatremia due to extra renal water losses. We've got hyperkalemia, which is due to an iatrogenic type 4 renal tubular acidosis. A metabolic acidosis, which again is due to an iatrogenic, meaning this is due to the spironolactone. And a high BUN and creatinine due to extracellular fluid volume loss. Okay, so we have a variety of things that we're going to use to treat her. Okay, so is there anything on this list that you would absolutely say this is not a good idea? Normal saline. Normal saline. There's one situation. You guys know I actually love normal saline. I use it a lot. But this is another situation. If you just spent the entire week trying to get volume off this lady, turning around and giving it to her again, makes no sense whatsoever. Okay, so this is probably not a good idea. You want to give her k -exalate? Not for a K of 5.2. Okay, certainly not for a K of 5.2. And studies have also shown that, quite frankly, the diarrhea that you get with the lactulose alone, or sorbitol or whatever you use, probably get rid of as much K as you would with the, with the k exhalate as well. D5W at 100 cc's an hour. What if you were hypernatremic? What would you want to do? Drink water, right? So you would probably just encourage this woman to drink oral water. Okay, but you might want to stop her lactulose so her diarrhea went away. You may or may not want to give her some bicarbonate. This is kind of a plus minus. We're not going to do that. We're probably going to stop these both for now. 
because her BUN and creatinine have gone up and her K has gone up. Okay, so again, the same situation in somebody who is on a loop diuretic and a potassium sparing diuretic plus having diarrhea. You look at that patient day to day to day and you tell yourself, wow, her spironolactone, she may get hyperkalemic and get a metabolic acidosis. With this Lasix, you know, she is going to have a decrease in her extracellular fluid volume and her BUN and creatinine are likely to go up. With all this diarrhea, it's going to give her metabolic acidosis and um, uh, an elevation in her BUN and creatinine as well as water loss is giving her hypernatremia. So again, this would be a situation where you would look at the electrolytes every day and say, what do I need to alter just a little bit? Maybe if you had done nothing more than simply back off her lactulose three or four days before that, maybe she wouldn't have been in quite as bad a shape. All right, so this is on integrity, I believe. Yes, okay, so for everybody's fun and enjoyment for after the lecture, I have given you four cases to look at. I will be happy to discuss these with anybody, but these are just fun. Patient with vomiting comes in with this set of electrolytes and urine set of electrolytes, and I have a series of questions here. We have a 72-year-old woman who presents with a blood pressure of 78 over 40 and an altered sensorium. She's got a few issues here, okay? 57-year-old man with altered mental status. He, too, has a couple of issues going on here. And a 34-year-old man who presents uh, with weakness, with significant hyperkalemia. So, you guys probably think that people who study physiology just figured out like everything there was to figure out about salt and water balance and ion transport in the kidney and stuff like that about 20 years ago and uh, you know now we know it all. I am here to tell you that there have been some unbelievably exciting advances in our knowledge of fluid and electrolyte homeostasis um, and uh, things that I would absolutely love to have a chance to talk to you guys about. The concept of places in your body that store sodium. Updates in the diagnosis and treatment of acute hyponatremia syndromes. There's a lot going on there. Use and limitations of the Baptans. Now that they've been out for a while, we're seeing the pros and the cons of using them. Updates in the regulation of potassium excretion. Pendrin, does anybody know what Pendrin is? Does anybody know what Pendred syndrome is? Probably not. It's a, it's a relatively obscure syndrome. But, you know, Pendrin has emerged as an interesting distal tubule regulator of salt homeostasis. And then the Wink kinases. Are any of you guys familiar with the Wink kinases? Okay. So Wink, W-N-K, actually stands for with no lysine, since in the biochemical word K stands for lysine. So there's a new set of uh, kinases in the distal tubule that regulate sodium and potassium homeostasis. Um, these are all really exciting advances that are actually beginning to have clinical applications. So with that, I will stop. I'm happy to answer anybody's questions. Um, I hope that these cases were of some utility to you. And that's it.